Joe Biden is currently on a world tour to try to get anyone out there to produce any more oil. It's gotten so bad he's hitting up history museums to see if that T-Rex has turned into a fossil fuel yet. Problem is, the only country that seems to want to sell more of their oil is Russia. Now, most critics are setting their sights on Biden for not doing enough to replace this Russian oil with other foreign and domestic sources. What I want to figure out today is a similar but more specific question. Why aren't those sources just producing more oil on their own? I mean, this should not be a hard sell right now. Have you seen prices? Pump more, name your price, and someone's gonna buy it. Profit. So why is it that I keep hearing that groups like the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries are just sort of shrugging and saying, eh, we'll pass. Export petroleum, it's right there in your name. The conversation has gotten so bad that the plea has evolved from, hey, you want to produce a little bit more oil too? Alright, alright, don't freak out. I'm going to start releasing some of my oil from a strategic oil stockpile. Just please stay the production course and don't make any cuts. Bar is so low you can stub your toe on it. So why wouldn't OPEC want to sell more of their oil at a time when prices are so high? Well, as you can imagine, there are a few motivating factors out there. First, the structure of OPEC itself. You see, Saudi Arabia is considered the de facto leader of OPEC, with the de facto second in command being none other than Russia. To nip some comments right in the bud, no, Russia is not officially a part of OPEC, but they're a part of all the agreements and the co-chair of the organization. All of the OPEC countries agreed to these current production rates back at the beginning of the pandemic. And Russia, well they aren't exactly chomping at the bit for Saudi Arabia and others to start boosting their production. Now interestingly enough, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a huge and a very contentious debate between Saudi Arabia and Russia over the future of oil production. You see, at the beginning of the pandemic, oil prices were cratering, and Russia was seeing American fracking industry pumping a whole bunch of oil. They were telling OPEC, oh, well if America can do it, why can't we? Neither of us are a part of OPEC, you can't regulate me. Now, Of course, the short answer was, well Russia, you guys have a nationalized oil industry. Putin gives a production directive and Gazprom figures out how to get there. In America, on the other hand, well, Trump can't just publish some sort of directive to Exxon and say, we need more oil. Eventually, then President Trump successfully negotiated a huge deal to slash oil production across all of OPEC, Russia, and the United States. Now that production cut deal came back to haunt us today. So how did Trump cut? domestic production without cutting domestic production in a way that brought Russia and the rest of OPEC into the fold and cutting their own production. Well, simple. He just made an economic argument to all the leaders in OPEC. Now, it was not immediately clear if the Trump administration actually made a formal commitment to cut production in the United States, but what they were arguing was, with prices plummeting, many companies in the country have already reduced their output. With prices plummeting in a fully privatized oil industry, all Trump had to do was look at OPEC and say, alright, I can't tell these businesses to produce less oil, but the cost of oil is less than the cost of their production, so they're all going to go out of business. I'm going to strategically not support the industry so capitalism will decrease our production naturally. See, Russia and everyone else, you can agree to decrease your production as well. It was really mission accomplished as far as successfully kneecapping America's ability to produce oil in alignment with OPEC goals. Now this brings us back to today, because with Russia, one of the world's largest oil producers eyeing OPEC's emergency exit, if you're a member of OPEC, you gotta proceed with caution here. Even when they're out in the doghouse, gotta slip them a little bit of meat to keep them in the fold. More specifically, with Mr. Novak, Russia's deputy prime minister serving as a co-chair of OPEC, yikes. 
discussions of the details of output increases might be, at best, awkward. You know that thing that the whole world is doing right now to punish me? Well, I vote we don't help them do that. Who wants to stick with the production cuts we negotiated a few years ago? If you don't maintain those production cuts, I'm out. You're going to have yet another major country cashing in on your production cuts to keep those prices high. Now the trade off here seems to be some sort of temporary increase in profits by selling more oil while prices are high, while at the same time the cost is driving a huge divide in the highly profitable business of limiting oil production overall for when prices are good and earning our huge profits. Now that is a price that Saudi Arabia seems to not be willing to pay. The Saudis and Emiratis have said this week specifically that they won't break up their energy market alliance with Russia and pump more to help the United States and the West with their confrontation with Moscow. Now, of course, that's a pretty huge reason for why they're not increasing the output, but there's another reason as well. You see, Saudi Arabia might be wary of production increases in general. Production increases are a lot like getting in shape. You know, you make your New Year's resolution, you announce a production increase, and it's great at the first stage. But then you actually have to work at doing it. You see, this carries with it a few problems that compound into one major problem. Basically, it takes slow, consistent, and deliberate investment to build out new production. Meanwhile, the price of oil is just zip, zip, zipping all over the place. It's a true roll of the dice as to where the price is going to be tomorrow, much less in a year. I mean, in no time flat, we went from Donald Trump calling up Saudi Arabia and Putin to try to get them to cut back on 10 million barrels of oil a day to support the low prices of oil, to today, Joe Biden calling up those very same people trying to play the UNO reverse card on them. Please, make those 10 million barrels come back. Now, there are a ton of simmering fires that could destroy the price of oil overnight. OPEC delegates say they're worried about a resurgence of COVID-19, which has led to new lockdowns in China, and they also see the United States holding talks that could lift sanctions on about 1.5 million barrels a day of Iranian oil production, and about 300,000 barrels a day of Venezuelan oil output. Now, all these potential headlines and more come right at the time when your new oil production increases are going to be put in place. Which is not the grand opening you're looking for when you're doing your ribbon cutting ceremony. This problem is magnified for America because, as I mentioned earlier, unlike countries with state owned oil companies, a bunch of our companies just sort of closed up shop in 2020. So we would be stuck at square one, redeveloping our oil production, as opposed to countries like Saudi Arabia, who would instead just be scaling up their oil production. We're talking years versus months here. Because of these two major factors, not wanting to leave OPEC ally Russia high and dry, and uncertainty about oil's price future a few months out, OPEC is going to stick to their reduced production agreement that they negotiated back in 2020. If only we had a pool of pre-produced oil that we could dip our hoses into right now and have access to overnight. All right. The strategic petroleum reserves. Temporary brake shocks is exactly what this was made for. Don't need to pump it out, just need to sort of flip a switch, bada bing, bada boom, start selling it tomorrow. Now, unfortunately, the rate of petroleum we're extracting from these strategic oil reserves is, well, just a drop in the barrel when compared to the rate of oil we sacrificed by refusing to continue to buy Russian oil. As of now though, well, that's the main option we have in our hand. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube. First, if you're interested in learning about the Trump negotiated Russia production cuts, video over here. I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put my, my videos, and if you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.